All right, I want to invite your attention to John chapter 18 this morning. John chapter 18. Uh, And this morning as we look into the scriptures, as we look into this chapter in John's gospel, uh, we find Jesus Christ and his, his time of getting to the cross is ever getting close. It's really nearing that he's, he's going to get to the cross. And here in John chapter 18, we find him being betrayed. Uh, we find him being arrested. We find him uh, on trial before several different people. But as all of this is going on, as they come in, into this garden and as they arrest Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is in control in these events. And John paints us that picture. That even as they are arresting Jesus, even as they are binding him, that he is in absolute control in all of these events in John chapter 18. We find Jesus as he is pictured the determined Savior. He is determined to pay the sin debt. He is determined to finish the work that God has sent him to do. He's determined uh, to pay our debt on the cross of Calvary. He is determined to fulfill his purpose, and that is to die for the sins of the world. John chapter 18, I want to invite you to stand with me. Beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says in verse number one here, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his, his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, They went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. I want you to go back to verse number 11. And Jesus, after Peter has chopped off the ear of Malchus, this is what Jesus says, listen to it again, put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? We see Jesus, the determined Savior. Let's bow and ask him to help us today. Heavenly Father, uh, we come into your presence, God. We thank you uh, for the songs that we've been able to lift our voices in praise and in worship today. And God, we're just thankful to be here in, in this place. We're thankful, God, that you meet with us when we come together and when we assemble ourselves. And Lord, it's my prayer today that your spirit would move freely in this service Lord, help us to not hold anything back, but help us to give our all to you today. And Lord, I pray that maybe there's that person here this morning, and God, they're lost. They're on their way to hell without you. They're on their way to an eternity without anybody or without Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today you might now convict them, God. Just bring a heaviness on their heart. Bring them to a place where they either accept you or reject you. God, I pray this morning that 
we'd see souls saved in this service, that we'd see people saved in our midst today. Lord, I pray that we might worship you, that we might fall before you and lay our all on the altar as saved people. God, forgive us where we fail you. Speak to us today. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanking you. Uh, you can be seated today. In John uh, chapter 18, what we notice and what we find here, we see Jesus as a suffering Christ. We see Jesus as he's being betrayed. He is arrested. He's tried before his enemies. And through it all, we see his strength. And through it all, we see his character, don't we? Through everything, we see how strong Jesus is. We see the purpose of why he came. We see that there was nothing that was going to stop him from going to the cross of Calvary, putting his back on that cross, being crucified, and paying our sin debt. We find Jesus the determined Savior today. Not once do we see Jesus shrinking from this task of paying that sin debt. And I say bless his name this morning. Not once do we see Jesus as a coward and he's running for his life and he's hiding, against, uh, he's hiding from those who are going to come arrest him. No. We see Jesus as a lamb led to the slaughter. We see Jesus with dignity. We see Jesus with boldness and with his head held high. He endures every bit of this in John chapter 18. He is carrying out the plan to redeem fallen man. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 6. Isaiah wrote a long time ago, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now, let me ask you that. Does it sound like a conquering, determined man right there? He says, I gave my back to the smiters. I want you to know no man could hang Jesus on a cross unless he willingly allowed that to happen. He said, I gave my back to the smiters. He says, he says I, gave my, I, I gave my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, but Jesus was determined. Jesus was being the sacrifice. And as I see his determination, I want you to understand as a child of God, as I see Jesus so determined to pay my sin debt, it moves me, y'all. Can I say that? We're in Texas. It moves me, y'all. It moves me to want to give my very best for him. It moves me to want to serve him better than I ever have in my life. It moves me to want to be more faithful to him and to be faithful to his cause. It moves me to want to tell others about him because we have a Savior who was determined and willing to die and to pay our sin debt. I'm going to tell you a message as good as that we don't need to send. We need to share a life-changing message, this gospel message. And as I see his determination, he is no victim here, but he is the master of the moment. He is no less in control in John chapter 18 as he was in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. Jesus is in control, and he suffered all these things with his eyes fixed on the goal. He suffered it all, seeing you and me coming to know him as our personal Savior. He suffered it all because he didn't want the world to die and to go to hell. He suffered it all because he wanted us to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And let me say this. Let me, let me just give you some good news. Jesus has finished all the work for men to be saved from hell. Jesus, he has finished all the work. Now listen, salvation is so much more than just saving you from hell. Salvation is, is placing you into the family of God. Salvation is giving you a relationship with the Heavenly Father. But yes, it, it, here's the message that I want you to get this morning. If you're here and you, you have a feeling of maybe you're not right with God, you have a feeling that maybe you've never been born again, let me say this to you. You don't have to go to hell today. Jesus has finished the work. He was a determined Savior. You don't have to die and go to hell. 
You don't have to die and spend a Christless eternity. You don't have to go through this life without having a heavenly Father. But Jesus has accomplished all the work. He has done everything. Jesus suffered untold agony. Jesus suffered the wrath and the judgment of God. And what this means to you is this. You can be born again today. You can radically change. You can leave here a child of God. And we pray that you do. Don't we, saved? We pray if there's one per just one person here this morning, we pray that you would come to Jesus Christ. Really, that's, what, that's why we're here after we're saved is to pray and to try to get others to come to Christ. Now I want you to notice three things with me, okay? Notice, first of all, in this text, we see his deity. We see his person here uh, in verses 1 through 11. We see his divine person. And notice his statement in, in verse uh, 4. All right, and we're looking at Jesus' divine person. And notice verse number 4 of this text. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And so they come to arrest Jesus Christ. And Jesus, it, it, it plainly says, he knows all things. He knew that they were coming. He knew that this was the night. He knew that this was the time. His hour had come. We looked at that last week. But he says, Who do you seek? In verse number 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Man, I just, I, I love this part of this story. When Jesus says, I am. He's not just saying, here I am, boys. He's saying, I am God in the flesh. You remember when God told Moses in the Old Testament, Moses said, who am I going to say sent me? Why are they going to believe me? And God said, you tell them, I am has sent you. And now Jesus says, I am he. And when Jesus says this, they all, all of these soldiers, these trained men, these soldiers, these fighting men, these tough men, these rough men, they all fall backward when Jesus just says, I am he. Verse number 7, notice, then, then ask ye them again, whom seek ye? And I'm going to tell you, I believe this is when I would have said, never mind. <laughs> they fall backward, and Jesus said, now let me ask you again, who do you seek? And again, they say, Jesus of Nazareth but I'm gonna tell you this wasn't the plan of those Roman soldiers this was the foreordained plan of Almighty God notice his deity again and listen he is uh, Jesus Christ today he is still the great I am you listen to me he's not the great I was he is still the great I am and I'm going to tell you, when we, what that means to us, that Jesus is the great I am, it means this, when I can't, I am can. When I can't, I am is able. When I, when I feel all alone, I am is present. When I, uh, when I fall and when I cannot do it, I, the great I am is capable when I don't know and, and I'm all stressed out and I'm worried, I can rest in the fact that I am is in control. When, when, when I need something in my life, I can rest in the fact that I am is my provider. He's not I was. He is the great I am. Verse number 6 tells us that when he said this, they fell to the ground. The Bible says there was a band here, and a band may have been four to 600 soldiers. Can you imagine that? Here they come with torches. Here they come expecting Jesus to break and run. Here they come expecting Jesus perhaps to stand up and to fight them. Jesus just says, I am he. They fall to the ground. Listen, I want you to understand this. They could never, ever, ever arrest Jesus Christ unless he is the determined Savior, unless he is the willing Savior to even go with these men. And he proved it right here. Don't think they hung Jesus on a cross and he's a victim. No, sir. He is in absolute control. 
He is paying your sin debt. And what this means is that Jesus is God. All right, get that. Jesus is God. You say, well, preacher, why do you make such a big deal about that? Because that is the only difference between heaven and hell. Jesus is God. It's not enough for you to believe that Jesus is a good teacher sent from God. It's not enough for you to believe that Jesus was a good role model to pattern your life after. It's not enough to believe that Jesus was some religious leader or that he was a really good man, but we must accept his deity, that he is God that came down in the flesh. He is the God that paid our sin debt. And so the, the big question this morning is this. I don't want to skip too fast over this. I want you to think about it. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good man? Is he just a guy that had some really good ideas and they hung him on a cross? Was he the sacrifice of some movement? Or is Jesus Christ the Son of God, God the Son in the flesh that paid our sin debt, that paid our penalty, that died in our place so that we could have a relationship with Almighty God? Who is Jesus? Notice he's concerned for his disciples. In verse number 8 and verse number 9, Jesus got a lot on his plate right here. He's got a lot coming up in the near future, but verse number 8, Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me. Have I lost none? So Jesus said, look, I am the one that you want. You let these disciples go. You let them go their way. You see, Jesus... In, in, in this hour of, of, of bearing the, this, the weight of sin, he was more concerned for their welfare than he was for his own. May I say this, and we'll move on. He's still concerned with the welfare of his children. He's still concerned with our needs, etc. Notice the third thing about his deity. He shows compassion to Malchus. In verse number 10 and verse number 11, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. <laughs> I read commentary that said Peter just missed. He, he just wasn't a good shot because he was trying to take his head off. And he missed and he chopped his ear off. So Peter gets out his sword and the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. He said, Put away your, your sword. And he picks this guy's ear up and places it back on its head. I'm going to tell you, only God can do that. Only God can do that. We see God, the, the God-man here. And he restores this guy's ear. Most of us, when Peter would have drawn that sword and said, I'm going to take a stand for you, Jesus, most of us would have said, good job, Peter. But not Jesus. Jesus died for Malchus. Jesus laid down his life for Malchus. He laid down his life for his enemies. Jesus died for those who crucified him. And Jesus reached out to his enemy in love. By the way, let me remind you, we were the enemies of God. All of us. You say, preacher, that offends me. I can't help that. We were the enemies of God. And he saw me. He knew me as his enemy. And he loved me as his enemy. He reached out to me. He had compassion on me. He died for me, his enemy. Don't get it twisted, ladies and gentlemen. I'd be in hell but for the grace of Jesus Christ. Notice he's dedicated to finish what he came to do. Verse number 11, he says, The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink this bitter cup? He says, Peter, put up your sword. I'm going to that cross. He says, he doesn't look for a way out here. He doesn't search for an escape clause. He doesn't try to cut a deal. 
but he set his face to Calvary. He set his face to go to the cross and to drink the bitter cup of death for you and for me. And I say, what a Savior we have. He didn't shirk from that. He went to the cross. He said, Peter, put up your sword. Peter, I've got to drink this cup. Peter, I've got to go to the cross. I've got to die for the sin of the world. It is for this reason that I've come to this world. Notice, secondly, in this text, not only do we see his divine person, but secondly, we see uh, his determination. We see his determined passion. In verse number 12 and verse number 13, notice his determination, his determined passion, even in his arrest. Verse 12, then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Notice this, they come and they arrest Jesus and they bind him and they take him away. He doesn't resist and he doesn't retaliate. He submitted like a lamb led to the slaughter. Why? Because he is the determined Savior. At any moment, and we say this, at any moment he could have called down angels from heaven and they could have rescued him from the cross. But I say this, we just witness it. He don't need those angels to rescue him from the cross. He could have, he could have spoke one word off the lips of the lips that said, let there be light, and there was light. Those powerful lips, he could have spoke one word. He could have thought one thought, and all of those enemies would have been destroyed. But he doesn't do that because he is determined. He has passion to fulfill what he came to do. He allowed it because he loves us. Hello? He allowed it because he loved us. He allowed it because he knew that we couldn't get to God without him doing this, without him fulfilling and drinking this cup. Now notice this, we see his dignity in his trial. We've looked at his arrest. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't retaliate. He doesn't resist. Now notice in his trial, and we're not going to read all of this, but I do want to read verse 23. And Jesus here, he's, he's before this priest, and he says, if I have spoken evil, they've, they, they've hit Jesus. And Jesus in verse 23 says, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why did you hit me? I want you to notice his dignity in his trial. He goes before Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod, and he's just bouncing back and forth. But there's a lot of things about his trial that were illegal, and we would have called somebody that infringed on our rights if we'd have been Jesus. All right, illegal things. I want to give you a few of those things. Arrests could not be made at night, and that's when this arrest happened. It took place at night and on the eve of the Sabbath. That was against the law. A guilty sentence could, could only be made the day after trial. That didn't happen. The Sanhedrin was only supposed to investigate charges. They had no authority to make charges, yet they make these charges against Jesus. The charges against Jesus changed in the trial. How do you think that will hold up in court? Well, it really doesn't matter because Jesus is a determined Savior. He's not worried about the injustice of the trial. He's going to the cross. Think about this. The requirement of two witnesses was not met in this trial. The court did not meet in the required place according to the law. I'm going to tell you, an attorney would have had a heyday with the trial of Jesus Christ. Man, they'd have had him free the next day. Because of all the injustices, because of all the illegal things, Here's another thing. Christ was not given any defense at all. They, they, would, they should have really investigated the facts with an exhaustive search, but they didn't do that. Here's another thing that was against the rule. The Sanhedrin could not give the death penalty, but they did in this case. 
The Creator stood before the creation on trial. But He's a determined Savior. I want you to notice the third thing about His determined passion. He's determined in spite of alienation, in spite of rejection. Notice in verse 2 and verse 3, He's betrayed by Judas. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And we understand in another passage that G Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Betrayed by Judas. Didn't matter to Jesus. He was going to the cross. Notice in verse 15. Verse number 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known of the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Peter went as far with Jesus as he was going to go. He stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? Listen to what Peter says. I'm not. I'm not, he says. Verse 18, And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them. And now Peter's warming himself by the enemy's fire. Peter says, I don't know who he is. I mean, perhaps what would cut the heart of Jesus the most was this bitter rejection of a man that said, you know what? I'll go to death with you. I'll die for you. If that's what it takes, Jesus, this is what I'll do. And they, then they asked, they asked Peter, they said, you're one of those. He said, I don't even know him. I'm not one of those. Go down to verse 20, 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. And they said, there, therefore unto him art not thou also one of his disciples. He denied it. He said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Here Peter denies Jesus Christ, the one that said, If all others leave you, I'll stay with you. I'll die for you. I'll even go to death for you, Jesus. And then notice in verse 38 the rejection he's rejected at this point by Israel verse 38 Pilate saith unto him what is truth and when he had said this he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them I find in him no fault at all but ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. He was a criminal. He was there because he had done something wrong. And now this crowd cries, Release unto us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. He is rejected by Israel. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Let me say this. He, he was determined to go to the cross in spite of that rejection. Maybe where I would have said, you know what, you people, you crazy people don't want to cooperate, I'm out. He's determined though. That's what I want you to get. He's determined. And I want you to understand this. Every day people reject Jesus Christ. Every day people reject Jesus. And think about it, we're having a service right now, but right now there are so many of these types of worship services going on around the country. In this, in this day, there are so many services going on around the world. I wonder how many people in those services are rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting His sacrifice, rejecting His love, rejecting what He came to do. 
Listen, let me, let me plead with you this morning. If you're here and you're lost, don't be a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Don't be a fool when it comes to Jesus Christ. Accept him. And then thirdly, I want you to notice his devoted purpose. We see his devotion. We see his devotion in his purpose. Notice, I want you to go back to verse 37. In verse 37, Pilate therefore saith unto him, Art thou a king then? <laughs> Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. Does that sound like a victim? Not at all. He said, This is why I'm here. This is why I came to this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone's of the truth, heareth my voice. Notice this, he had to go to the cross. You say, well, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Why couldn't he just come and, and leave an example for us? Why couldn't he just work something else out? Why did he have to die on the cross? And I've asked myself that question before. But let me say this, he had to go to the cross because it takes blood to deal with sin. You don't just get to God however you want to. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible says there without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no remission for sin. There had to be a cross. There had to be the blood of God shed on that cross. And listen, I know that people today, they take so many ways. They take many different ways to get to God. They take many different ways to get to heaven. But listen, I'll take the blood of Jesus Christ. There are no other ways. Jesus and his blood is the only way that a man gets to God. And Jesus said it himself. He's not a way to God. He is the only way to God. He's the only way to the Heavenly Father. And it took his death to satisfy God and to bridge the gap between holy God and fallen men. Why? Because God came and paid our debt. God paid our debt. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. A wage, that's something we earn. We've earned death. We've earned eternal separation from Almighty God. For the wages of sin is death. But listen, he doesn't stop there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Have you ever worked from a, for a gift? No, you haven't. If you worked for it, you worked for pay. You didn't work for a gift. A gift is something that's given freely. And Jesus Christ came. He, there had to be a cross. There had to be a cross. And you say, well, that gospel's kind of bloody. I think I'll, I'll try to find something else. Listen, there, there is no other saving gospel. There had to be a cross. There had to be a crown. Notice he had to wear a crown. He says, I bear witness to the truth. To what truth? Well, Jesus said, destroy this temple. And he's speaking about his flesh. And he says, I'll rebuild it in three days. He's bearing witness to the truth. And I want you to know on that third day, he arose victorious. He, he brought that blood in somewhere in that time, and, and this ought to get you excited today. He brought that blood to heaven, and he made that sacrifice at the altar in heaven. He brought that blood, and he sprinkled it in heaven. And I can just see those angels as they're watching and they're waiting, and as they see Jesus Christ coming, they say, there's Jesus, and he's got the blood. He's got the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. He's come to make the payment for the sin of the world listen there's a lot of blood been shed throughout the Old Testament a lot of blood been shed in the tabernacle but the blood of Jesus is the last blood that God needed it's the only blood that God could use as payment for the sin there had to be a crown and then 
think about this. There had to be a cup. He had to drink the cup. And what that fully means, I think, is that the wrath of God, the judgment of God that should have been poured out on me was poured out on Jesus at the cross of Calvary. That's the cup that he drank. The wrath, the judgment of God. And you say, well, you know, I just get to go to heaven free. No, you don't. Heaven costs the blood of God. It, Jesus Jesus bore the, the wrath and the judgment of Almighty God there hanging on that cross, and he paid that sin debt. Listen, you don't have to work to be saved, but don't, don't dare think that it doesn't cost. It, cost. it cost a great deal. He had to drink this cup. This morning, as we get rid, let's have a song of invitation today. And this morning, as, as we get ready to prepare for this invitation, I don't know about you, but as a saved child of God, this message still does something to me. This message, this gospel message, it still moves me. Let me ask you, and each of us know in our heart how we've been doing for Jesus, what we've been given to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, we have a Savior that's worthy of my absolute best. As we see Jesus, this determined Savior, if you're saved, don't just shrug that off and say, well, that's for a lost person. No. No, friend, as a child of God, that ought to move us to come and to worship Jesus Christ. That ought to move me to say, you know what? I want to be better than I was yesterday. And then let me say something else to you, saved person. You know, there could be a lost person in our midst. Chances are there, there is. We need to be praying for that lost person to come to Jesus Christ. How awesome would it be? And we're getting ready to have this youth-led revival. And man, we need, to, we need to be in the altar. We need to be praying for a moving of God. We need to be praying for these services that are coming up. We need to be praying that God would do great things. Revival doesn't start March 1st. It starts, it starts right here in the altar. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if the saved would just flood the altar? And, and pray for that person that's in our midst today that's lost and needs a relationship with God. And just give it to God and pray that God would convict that soul during this song of invitation. Pray for revival. Praise Him because He is such a good and great God. Maybe it'd be awesome if we'd flood the altar and just pray for God's Spirit to be so strong, so strong that the lost would come to know Christ. And then let me say this, and we'll close. If you're here today and you're lost, why don't you come to Jesus Christ? Why don't you come and be saved? Listen, <clears throat> some people say, well, you have to be religious enough. Listen to me, salvation is not about you. And people that are very religious, what it does, it exalts them. Salvation is about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. It's a gift that we must, we must accept that gift. And it exalts the name of Jesus Christ. This morning, whatever you need, I pray that you come. As we stand together this morning and as we sing today. 564.